Hi everybody, my name is Colin Wallace and today we'll be building upon our previous two lectures for Physics 114 and we'll be talking about some applications of Newton's laws. If you are following along with the reading for this section, uh, there's actually no new reading. Uh, we're only asking you to go back and review those chapters or those sections from chapter 5 that you were asked to read for last time. So as I mentioned, today is all about uh, applying Newton's laws to different circumstances. So from that perspective, we're not really going to be introduced to any new physics today. However, I'm certainly going to talk about uh, several problem-solving techniques that you're going to find to be really useful uh, when applying Newton's laws in general, and specifically for applications that you'll see in studio, in the homework, and of course on the exams as well. So let's go ahead and start with this question. Please pause your recording, read this question to yourself, and then send your answer over to Gradescope. So to answer this question, you should take a look at which two forces we're asked to compare. Uh, we're asked to compare the normal force that the person exerts on the floor and the normal force the floor exerts on the person. Those two forces are third law force pairs. And according to Newton's third law, those two forces must always have the exact same magnitude. Now the value of that magnitude may change as the elevator speeds up or slows down. But at any instant in time, Newton's third law is always true. And so the correct answer here must be C. Here's another question for you. Once again, pause your recording, read this question, and submit your answer to Gradescope. So when we're thinking about the answer to this question here, we should take this uh, one step at a time here. So the first step is to take a look at that first blank. So the sentence says, when a small car collides with a large truck, the magnitude of the force that the truck exerts on the car is, and we're asked to compare this to the magnitude of the force that the car exerts on the truck. Once again, these are third law force pairs. According to Newton's third law, whatever force the car exerts on the truck must be equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction, to the force that the truck exerts on the car. So we can immediately eliminate choice A and choice D. So our only possibilities are B, C, and E. Now at this point, I know some of you are thinking, well, wait a minute. I know when a large truck collides with a small car, that small car is gonna receive a lot more damage than the large truck. So how can it be that both the small car and the large truck experience a force of the exact same magnitude? Here's what's going on. It's absolutely true that um, the, the small car is going to suffer more damage, but the reason is not because it experiences a bigger force than the large truck. Those two forces are the same. The reason the small car is gonna experience more damage comes when we take a look at the acceleration, which is the second part of this question here. So both vehicles experience the same force, but the truck has a bigger mass than the car. So consequently, the acceleration experienced by the truck is gonna be smaller than the acceleration experienced by the car. So for the second blank here, we need to say that the magnitude of the car's acceleration is greater than the magnitude of the truck's acceleration. So that means the correct answer to this question is B. And so again, it's, it's not in the force that we find the explanation for why the car suffers a bigger effect, more damage uh, as a result of this collision. The reason the car suffers more damage comes in the fact that for that same force, its smaller mass must experience a larger acceleration. Okay, so these two questions uh, basically review some of the ideas that we encountered in the previous uh, couple of lectures on Newton's laws. Now we're gonna move forward today and see some new applications. But one of the things I wanna do right now is I wanna help get you set up for the studio for this module. Uh, for the studio for this module, you're gonna be uh, needing to basically bring everything you know about Newton's laws as well as kinematics together to figure out something about the motion of a grasshopper. So you're gonna be dealing with some real data here. And so to get you set up for some of the thinking you're gonna to have to do in this studio, I wanna pose this question to you. Please pause your recording and submit your answer to Gradescope. 
Okay, so we're given an acceleration versus time graph, and we're asked to think about the area under the curve here. And so from kinematics, you should know that that area under the curve has something to do with the velocity of the object. It's not the velocity of the object at a specific time, however. What we get when we find the area under this curve is the amount by which the object's velocity is gonna change over this time interval between zero and 20 seconds. So the correct answer to this question is B. So when you find the area under an acceleration versus time graph, you get the amount by which an object's velocity is going to change. Just like if you were given a graph of velocity versus time, the area under that graph would tell you the amount by which the object's position changes. In other words, it tells you the displacement of the object. We need to actually think about how to actually figure out what that area under the curve is. So please pause your recording and consider this question before sending your answer to grade scope. So one of the ideas this question is trying to get at is the fact that, you know, I don't actually have a specific formula that I can just plug numbers into to tell me the area under that blue curve that represents the acceleration. So I'm going to have to do some sort of an approximation for the area under the curve. And we're asked to think about, well, which of these three situations here is going to provide me with the best approximation? The correct answer here is choice C. So notice in choice A, um, this is going to underestimate the area under the curve. Each of these rectangles leaves quite a bit of blank space between the blue curve and the top of a rectangle here. So A is going to underestimate the area under the curve. B is going to overestimate the area under the curve because all those rectangles stick above the blue line. C does the best job of approximating this area. Uh, for every little bit of white space between the blue line and the top of a red rectangle, there's also a bit of a red rectangle that is protru protruding above the blue line. So C is our best approximation. So what we're doing here, approximating the area under the curve, using a bunch of rectangles. That is a technique called numerical integration. And don't let the term integration scare you. We're not really gonna be doing any calculus here per se. All we're gonna be doing is calculating some areas and adding them together in order to approximate a bigger area. This is a really important technique. You're gonna be doing this in the studio for today and the studio for next time and also for a few other studios uh, over the rest of the term. So I want to take a few minutes here and actually talk about how this is actually going to work. So let's take a look at each of these rectangles. And let's start by taking a look at the rectangle here that uh, exists between the time of 16 and 20 seconds. So ultimately, ultimately, we need to figure out the height of this rectangle. The height of that rectangle is not given by the acceleration at 16 seconds. It's also not given by the acceleration at 20 seconds. If I jump back one slide, if I were to use the acceleration at 16 seconds as the height of my rectangle, that would give me what I'm doing here in choice A, where I'm underestimating the area under the curve. Likewise, if I were to use the acceleration at 20 seconds to, uh, as my uh, height for my rectangle, that would be doing what I'm showing here in B, where we're overestimating the area under the curve. So what I wanna do for the area of this rectangle is the average acceleration in that time interval. In other words, find the acceleration at 16 seconds. Find the acceleration at 20 seconds. Take those two numbers and average them together. That average value should be the height of the rectangle you need to use if you want to do the best job possible of approximating the area under the curve. Now, that gives us the height of the rectangle. If we want an area, we also need to know the width of that rectangle. So the width of the rectangle it's just going to be the time interval that you're dealing with here. In this case, this rectangle has a time interval that goes from 16 to 20 seconds. So that's a time interval of four seconds. So once I know the height and the width of each rectangle, 
I can now calculate the area of each rectangle. The area is just going to be the height times the width, or in other words, it's, just, it's going to be the average acceleration during a time interval multiplied by that time interval. And I can do that for each of the five rectangles that are shown here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five rectangles. You can calculate the average acceleration and the time interval for each of those rectangles. Use those values to calculate the area of each rectangle. And then our approximation for the area under the curve is just going to be the sum of the areas of all those rectangles. So just take those five areas you calculated and add them all together. That will be the area under the curve, or at least a pretty good approximation for it. So that's conceptually what you're going to be doing when you do numerical integration. But for this particular example, we looked at an acceleration versus time graph, but you will see other examples with other quantities as we move forward in the class where you'll be doing numerical integration um, on other types of graphs. Because this idea is so important and is so fundamental for what you need to do in studio for today, um, I want to give you some practice doing this right now. So if you go to our Sakai site and you go to the folder for module eight, you're going to see an Excel file there called module eight warmup. Please go ahead and open up that file. Um, you're going to see some data there. It's basically going to reproduce the data that you see here that we use to generate this acceleration versus time graph. What I want you to do is pause your recording and take a few minutes to use numerical integration to determine the change in velocity between zero and 20 seconds. And I'll say right now, before you get started on that, there's one key difference between the Excel file data that you're given and what you're seeing here on the PowerPoint slide. In the PowerPoint slide, we had time intervals that were four seconds long. In the data you're given in Excel, you're told what the acceleration is every two seconds. So you can use two seconds as your time interval. So with that in mind, Go ahead and pause your recording right now and um, calculate that area to the curve. And then there's a space on grade scope where you can enter your result. Okay, so here on the screen, I've put up uh, the, the data that you saw in that Excel file. So in column A, we've got the time data. In column B, we've got the acceleration data. And here's the graph of acceleration versus time. And it's, it's basically the same graph that you just saw on the PowerPoint slide set as well. Now, I've created a second sheet down here where I actually calculated the result of the area into the curve. So let me go ahead and share that with you so you can see how I did this. So um, I've created this new column here that I called change in velocity. This is, this is where I'm calculating the area under the curve, or at least approximating the area under the curve with a rectangle. If I click on my first cell here, you can see the formula that I was using. Let me go ahead and click on that so you can see exactly what I'm doing here. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm averaging my acceleration in these two cells. So I'm taking the acceleration at zero seconds and the acceleration at two seconds, and I'm finding the average of those two values. Again, that's the height of the rectangle that I'm going to be using over this time interval. The width of the rectangle is going to be equal to the amount of time that passes between this first acceleration value and this second acceleration value. And the amount of time that passes is two seconds. So that's why I'm multiplying by two right here. If I take a look at the next entry, it's the same idea. Now I'm gonna try to figure out the area under the curve for the rectangle that uh, exists between two and four seconds. So I need to find the average acceleration between the acceleration at two seconds and the acceleration at four seconds. That's going to be the height of my rectangle. And then I've got to multiply it by the width of my rectangle, which once again is the time interval. It's how much time passes between these two values of the acceleration. And that's once again going to be two seconds. Now you may be looking at uh, this data set here and you may be saying, hey, right here at the very bottom, that cell is blank. Shouldn't there be some uh, data that's there? Why, why is that cell blank? Well, let's jump back up to what we have here where it says 181. Let me click on that cell and let me highlight what data it's using. So for this cell, um, I am calculating the area under the uh, curve uh, for a rectangle that extends between the time of 18 and the time of 20 seconds. So I'm basically 
looking at a rectangle that exists between these two values over here on my Excel graph. So this is actually going to be the final rectangle whose area I need to calculate. And it's going to require me to average these two acceleration values together and once again multiply by the time interval of two seconds. If I were to put something in here where I've got a blank cell right now, I would have to average for my acceleration the value here at t equals 20 second, and then it also have to know what comes next. What is my acceleration at 22 seconds? I don't have that data. That would correspond to some rectangle that is to the right of this curve here. So basically, whenever you're doing this process of finding the area under the curve, you're always going to have one fewer cell filled in here than you do for your data. And that's just because each of these cells here is spanning two uh, data points. So all of these terms that I have here, these all represent the areas of different rectangles over different time intervals. And so to find the total area under the curve, I've just got to add all of these together. So I can use the sum feature of Excel that automatically adds up all of those cells together. And I get 670. And the units are, of course, meters per second. So this tells me that my velocity changed by 670 meters per second between t equals 0 and t equals 20 seconds. So however fast this object happened to be moving at 0 seconds, by the time we get to 20 seconds, it is moving faster by an amount of 670 meters per second. So that's how you do numerical integration. And that's basically going to be the same procedure you'll be using at different points in the studio for this module. So now that we've reviewed how to do numerical integration, I want to move you on to some questions that um, uh, apply Newton's laws again. And so here's the first question that I want you to think about. Please go ahead, pause recording, read this question, and submit your answer to Gradescope. So the correct answer to this question is C. All of the accelerations have the exact same value. You can go ahead and kind of demonstrate this for yourself at home. Take three objects, any three objects you want. They could be books, they could be pads of paper, they could be whatever you want. Put them together and start pushing them. Apply a force to one of those objects and start pushing them. By however much one object speeds up, the others must also speed up because they stay connected, they stay together. It would be a very strange situation indeed if, for example, object B here ended up with a larger acceleration than object C. That would imply B would go flying past C, that these objects would separate out somehow. And that's never going to happen. Whenever you've got connected objects like this, they must have the exact same acceleration. Now, I've taught this class long enough that I know some of you are looking at this right now and you're thinking, okay, I get what you just said. But I tried to solve this question by applying Newton's second law. And when I do that, I've got this force here, and I've got the masses here. And so for each block, I can take that force, and I can divide it by the mass shown on the block, and that should give me my acceleration, right? And when I do that, well, a force divided by two kilograms gives me a very different acceleration than the same force divided by one kilogram and it's different from that force divided by three kilograms. So how can these three accelerations all be equal to one another? Is it the case that Newton's second law no longer applies to this situation? Well, Newton's second law most definitely does apply to this situation. Newton's second law is always true. The problem with the analysis I just described is that you have to remember what Newton's second law says. It does not say that force equals mass times acceleration. What Newton's second law says is that the net force acting on an object equals its mass multiplied by its acceleration. When I'm looking at these three boxes here, this force that I call F here is not the net force experienced by these boxes. Right, if I just look at box A, for example, yeah, it's experiencing this force F that's pushing it to the right, but it's also experiencing a force from box B that's pushing box A to the left. There's also a normal force that the floor exerts on A, and there's a weight force, and there may also be friction on this floor as well. So whenever you're applying Newton's second law, you've got to make sure that you're actually looking at the net force. You've got to look at the sum 
the vector sum of all the forces acting on an object. If you just pick one particular force and set that equal to the mass times the acceleration, there's a pretty good chance you're going to end up with the wrong answer. Uh, so we're actually going to, need to build upon this idea as we take a look at the next question here, which looks like this. This one's going to require you to do some calculations. So uh, when you pause your recording, you may want to get a uh, pencil or pen and a piece of paper, and probably also your calculator out as well. So please read this question, do the calculations, and then um, enter your answer into Gradescope. OK, so to answer this question, um, the first thing I want to do is I want to draw a free body diagram here. And in fact, even though the question doesn't ask me to explicitly draw a free body diagram, that's actually something you should always just get in the habit of doing whenever you get to a question that involves forces and Newton's laws. And part of the reason for that is, for those of you that have ever studied some, studied some psychology, you've probably learned that your short term or your working memory can only hold somewhere between five or seven pieces of information at any one time. So if I'm working on a problem and I don't draw a free body diagram, I have to hold in my working memory information about all the different forces that are acting on an object, what di their directions are, how they compare in terms of their relative magnitudes, what objects are exerting those forces on my object. It's a lot to keep track of, and I'm more likely to make a mistake. On the other hand, if I just go ahead and draw a free body diagram, then I've put down all this information that I already know about the situation onto my piece of paper, and that's gonna free up my working memory uh, so that I can devote it to some of the other tasks that I need to do to actually solve this problem. So I've gone ahead here and I've drawn the free body diagram uh, for block C. So the question is asking us about the magnitude of the force that block B applies to block C. So that is gonna be uh, this force, right here. I want to figure out the magnitude of the force that B exerts on C. Notice some things I've done here with my free body diagram. I've made sure that my normal force that the floor exerts on C has the same magnitude as the weight force that Earth exerts on C. I know those two have to have the same magnitude because I know block C has no acceleration in the Y direction. It's not rocketing up off the table or burrowing down into the table. It's sliding across the table. So I have no acceleration in the y direction, but I definitely have acceleration in the x direction. So I made sure to make this uh, normal force that B exerts on C have a larger magnitude, aka a longer arrow, than the friction force that the floor exerts on C. So we need to apply Newton's second law to answer this question here. So let me go ahead and write that down. That says the net force equals the mass of the object here. And this, the object is going to be object C times its acceleration. And those are vector quantities. Now, because this is a vector equation, I know that this equation applies both to the x components and to the y components. What I can write down is the net force of all of the forces in the x direction must equal the mass of C multiplied by the acceleration in the x direction. This equation is always going to be true, but Newton's second law also applies to the y component. So if I take my arrow here and I draw it down here, I can basically write the exact same expression for the y components. So I know that the net force in the, uh, for all the y components must equal the mass of C multiplied by the acceleration in the y direction. So let me go ahead and look at the equation that involves the x components. I'm going to start with that equation because if I look at the force that I want to figure out, the normal force that B exerts on C, 
Well, that force points in the x direction. So that seems like a reasonable place to start. Now, my net force in the x direction is going to depend on my two forces in the x direction. So the normal force that B exerts on C and the friction force that the floor exerts on C. So if I'm going to find the net force in the um, x direction, let me go ahead and let me go ahead and erase my y components here. If I'm going to go ahead and find my net force in my x direction, I'm going to have to take the difference between the normal force that B exerts on C and the friction force that the floor exerts on C. I have to, I have to take the difference because those two forces are pointing in opposite directions. I'm going to set that equal to the mass of C multiplied by its acceleration in the x direction. OK, I can solve this for the normal force. That normal force will be equal to, and let me take the friction force over to the other side of the equation. So I'm going to have my um, friction force that the floor exerts on C plus the mass of C times the acceleration. And we have an expression for the friction force. We know that the friction force is going to be equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction multiplied by the normal force that the floor exerts on C. And then this will be added to the mass of C multiplied by the acceleration in the x direction. So I know everything in this expression right now, except I don't know what the normal force of the floor on C happens to be. So this is something I need to calculate. But that's OK. I, I know how to do this. Um, I can go back to the y components. So if I go back to the y components here, where we have excuse me, the net force in the y direction equal to the mass of C multiplied by the acceleration. It's mine here, iPad. Let me try this again. Net force in the y direction equals the mass of C multiplied by the acceleration in the y direction. I know what my net force in the y direction is. I've got an upward pointing normal force and a downward pointing weight force. So my net force will be, if I define up to be positive and down to be negative, that will be the normal force minus the weight force. That will be equal to the mass of C. And my acceleration in the y direction is zero. I'm not accelerating the y direction at all. That acceleration we're given is only in the x direction. So I can put in a zero here for my y acceleration. And what this ultimately tells me is the normal force must be equal to in magnitude to this weight force, which is kind of what I already knew uh, when I drew my free body diagram. And it it's basically connects right with Newton's second law here. So if I use that result, if I say that the normal force that the floor exerts on C is equal to the weight force, well then, in that case, I know what the weight force is. It's just going to be the mass of C times the acceleration due to gravity. And so the normal force in this case happens to be equal to the mass of C times the acceleration due to gravity. I can take this result and plop it in up here for the normal force that the floor exerts on C. When I do that, let me show you the expression that you get. <clears throat> 
you're going to get the normal force that B exerts on C is equal to the coefficient of friction multiplied by the mass of C times little g plus the mass of C times the acceleration in the x direction. And now I know every expression. I know every value in this expression. I know the coefficient of friction. I know the mass of C. I know the acceleration due to gravity. And I know that the acceleration is 1.5 meters per second squared, because that is information that was given to us in the prompt for the question. So we can now take this expression, and we can plug in our values and actually calculate an answer to this question. So when you go ahead and plug in those numbers, you should find that the correct answer to this question is D, 16.3 newtons. That is the value you get when you plug in all those values. And so that is the magnitude of the force that block B applies to block C. OK, now that we've answered this question, let's go ahead and think about the next question here, which is this one. Please go ahead and read this question to yourself, pause recording, and then send your answer over to Gradescope. OK, so to answer this question, we must once again start by drawing the free body diagram for uh, B. And that's what I've done here. Um, notice I've got five forces acting on block B. So we've got the normal force that the uh, floor exerts on B. And we've got the weight force that Earth exerts on B. Those are my two forces that point in the Y direction. I've got a rightward force that A exerts on B. And in fact, this is the force that I want to solve for. This is the force that the question is asking me about. In the opposite direction, though, I've got two forces. I've got the normal force that C exerts on B. And I've also got the friction force that B is experiencing as it's sliding across the floor. So now that I've got my free body diagram written down, I can apply Newton's second law to block B. And it's the same situation as before. I'm going to say the net force acting on B is equal to the mass of B multiplied by its acceleration. That's what this first line here is showing. Now, because the force I'm looking for, N sub AB, is in the x direction, I'm going to start by looking at Newton's second law applied to the x component. So this block of text right here is basically just rewriting Newton's second law, but applied to the x components only. Now, I know what the net force in the x direction is going to be. So that's what, that's what all of this is showing that I've just underlined. All of that is my net force in the x direction. It's going to be equal to my normal force that A exerts on B. And then I'm going to subtract off of that, since they're pointing in the opposite direction, the friction force that the floor exerts on B, as well as the normal force that C exerts on B. And all of that is equal to the mass of B multiplied by the acceleration in the x direction. So now that I have this expression, I can solve for the normal force that A exerts on B. I just take my friction force and the normal force that C exerts on B over to the other side of the equation. And that's what I have down here in this line of equations right here. Then my next step is to realize that, hey, that friction force will be equal in magnitude to the coefficient of friction multiplied by the normal force that the floor exerts on B. And once again, I can apply Newton's second law to the y components to figure out what that normal force happens to be. Since there's no acceleration in the y direction, this normal force that the floor exerts on B will be equal in magnitude to the weight force that Earth exerts on B. And so I can write my final expression here as the normal force that A exerts on B will be equal to my coefficient of friction. My normal force that the floor exerts on B is equal, in this case, to the magnitude of the weight force. So that will be the 
mass of B multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity plus the mass of C, excuse me, not the mass, the normal force that C exerts on B plus the mass of B times the acceleration, the x direction. And now I know all of these values. We're given the coefficient of friction. We're given the mass of B. We're given the acceleration, the x direction. G is 9.8 meters per second squared, as always. You may be looking at this term here and say, well, how do I know what this force is? Remember, this force is the third law force pair to the force we just found on the previous question. So you can take the value of the force that uh, B exerts on C, and you know that the force that uh, C exerts on B will have the exact same value. So take your answer to the previous question, and you can pop it in right here. When you do this, we can actually calculate what the correct answer is going to be. And the correct answer for this question is once again D. It is 21.7 newtons. That is the value that you get when you plug in um, all of the terms that we were given on the equation that I just showed you on my iPad a second ago. Let's take one more question with this situation here. You could probably guess what it's going to be. Here it is. Go ahead, pause your recording, and work on this question, and then upload your answer to Gradescope. Okay, to address this question, we're basically it's the same procedure that we did on the previous question. So again, Notice I'm starting by drawing my free body diagram for block A, and I've got five forces on my free body diagram. In the y direction, I've got the normal force that the floor exerts on A. I've also got the weight force that Earth exerts on A. Of course, I've got the unknown force that we're solving for that's pointing in the, uh, to the right in the x direction. And then opposite of that, we've got a friction force that the floor exerts on A, and the normal force that B exerts on A. So once again, we're going to start with Newton's second law. That's what this first line is showing. Because the force I care about is pointing in the x direction, let me look at the x components here. So I will apply Newton's second law to the x components. And I've got three forces that point in the x direction. F, the normal force of B on A, and the friction force. Uh, of the floor on A. So this line here is showing what I get when I apply Newton's second law to the X components here. Uh, my net force will be equal to the force that's pointing to the right minus the two forces that are pointing to the left. And that net force will be equal to the mass of A multiplied by its acceleration in the X direction. So now we can take uh, everything except f over to the other side of the equation and that's what i'm showing here in this block of text so this is our expression for the unknown force and then the only thing we need to do now is to recognize that the friction force will be equal to the coefficient of friction multiplied by the normal force that the uh, floor exerts on a And once again, we can see if we apply Newton's second law to the y components, there is no acceleration in the y direction. And so because there's no acceleration in the y direction, and because there are only two forces acting in the y direction, that must mean that this normal force the floor exerts on A is equal in magnitude to the weight of A. So for my final expression here, I can write the normal force that B exerts on A plus the coefficient of friction multiplied by the weight force, which is going to be the mass of A times little g, plus the mass of A times the acceleration in the x direction. This will be the equation that I need to plug in numbers into to solve for the unknown force. Now, before we do that, I want to give you a word of warning. On all of the previous three questions that we've dealt with, We've been able to make the substitution that the weight force is equal in magnitude to the normal force that the floor exerts on the block. That'll be true in many cases. You can certainly find many problems where that's true, but it's not always going to be the case. 
So for example, if there were a third force pointing in the y direction, then I wouldn't be able to make that substitution. Or if one of those two forces, the normal force or the weight force, were at some angle with respect to uh, the other, then I couldn't just say that the normal force is equal in magnitude to the weight force. So we'll see some examples of this in the next lecture. But I just want to make sure right now that you don't leave this lecture thinking that it is always universally true that I can set a normal force equal to a weight force. That is not a law. That is not always going to be true. It happens to be true in the cases we've been looking at today, but it will not always be the case. So please keep that in mind as you're working on other questions throughout the course. Okay, so when you actually go and plug in numbers into that expression that we just found, you're going to find that the correct answer is, once again, D. So it's going to be 32.5 newtons. So this question here actually is a really nice question to look at because, it, it, again, it involves us putting together a lot of different pieces of information in terms of how the accelerations of the blocks compare. You need to think about the different forces that the blocks exert on one another. And hopefully you've seen that by starting with block C and working backwards, we actually do have enough information to figure out any force acting on any block in this entire situation. It takes a little bit of work, but it's not too bad. It's great practice for using Newton's second law. Let's take another example here. So here we go. We've got a child pulling a five kilogram crate of toys across the floor. The child's holding onto a string that's attached to the crate, and that string makes a 30 degree angle with respect to the horizontal. The string is going to exert a tension force of 17 newtons, and we're telling you that the crate is speeding up, and it's got an acceleration of 0.6 meters per second squared, and that points horizontally. The one that we don't know in this question is the coefficient of kinetic friction. So that's what we want you to calculate. So before we actually get to the place where we calculate that coefficient of kinetic friction, I've got a question I want you to answer. So please read this question that just popped up on the screen, pause your recording, and submit your answer to Gradescope. Okay, so this question is asking us to apply Newton's second law to the x components of the forces acting on the crate. So hopefully to answer this question, the first thing you did was to draw a free body diagram for the crate. I'm not gonna do that one for you right now. I want you to, to get some practice with drawing the free body diagram. So again, if you haven't drawn the free body diagram yet, please do so and make sure that your answer is consistent with that free body diagram. So if you draw the free body diagram, for the situation. And you break all the forces into their x and y components. And then you apply Newton's second law to the x components of those forces. You should find that the correct answer here is B. So we've got this tension force multiplied by the cosine of 30 degrees. That cosine of 30 degrees is picking out the x component of that tension force. And that x component of the tension force points in the opposite direction from the friction force. So to find the net force, we have to do this x component of the tension force minus the friction force. And that net force must be equal to the mass of the crate multiplied by the acceleration it's experiencing. So here we go. We can uh, then plug in for the friction force, the fact that uh, that will be equal to the coefficient of friction multiplied by the normal force that the floor is exerting on the crate. So we need to figure that out. We're not told what that value is. So just like on the previous questions with the three connected blocks, we now have to figure out what the value of that normal force is gonna be. And so that's the question you should think about right now. Please read this question, pause recording, and submit your answer to Gradescope. So in this question, this is basically building off the warning I just gave you with the three connected blocks, which is you can't automatically say that the normal force will have the same magnitude as the weight force. And the reason you can't do that in this situation is we actually have three forces that have components in the y direction. Remember, that tension force will point along the direction of that string that's attached to the crate. So it's going to have both an x and a y component here. The correct answer to this question turns out to be A. So I've got, if we define the direction of up to be positive, 
I've got an upward pointing normal force that the floor exerts on the crate. The tension force, or more specifically, the y component of the tension force, which is found by the sine of 30 degrees here, that is going to also be pointing up, so that will be positive. So I add those two together. That gives me the total amount of force I have pointing up. But I also have a force that's pointing down. That's the weight of the crate. But I know there's no acceleration in the y direction. Again, just like with the three connected blocks, this crate is not accelerating. Uh, it's not rocketing up off the floor. It's also not burrowing into the floor. So there's no acceleration in the y direction. So the correct answer here is A. So just to make explicit the solution plan that we've been using for this question and also for the previous questions is we are going to now use Newton's second law for the y components to get expression for the normal force that the floor is exerting on the crate. We now take that expression for the normal force and we're going to plug it into the expression for the x components because remember the um, friction force depends on what the normal force of the floor on the crate happens to be. Once we do that, we can then solve for the coefficient of kinetic friction, and then we can plug in numbers. So let's go ahead and execute this plan. Here's a question for you. Please go ahead and read this question, and then send your over answer over to Gradescope. So before I tell you the answer to this question, notice what I didn't do on this question. I did not just start plugging in numbers into my equations and then do algebra. In general, it is always best to stay symbolic before you plug in numbers. There are a few reasons for that. One, if you realize you make a mistake in your algebra somewhere, it's much easier to recognize that if you're working symbolically and also to change it. So for example, if you have a negative sign where there should be a plus sign, it's really easy to change that and then carry that change through all further symbolic expressions. Um, it's a lot harder to make that change or even to catch an error if you just have a bunch of numbers there. So please work symbolically. It also makes it easier for those of us that are grading your work to follow along with your work. So whenever possible, practice working symbolically and only as the final step should you enter in values into your equation. So if you carry out the algebra described in the pr uh, procedure outlined on the previous slide, you should find that the correct answer to this question is it choice D. D is in dog. This is your correct answer right here. So now that we have our expression for the coefficient of kinetic friction, we can plug in the values that were given and we can calculate that that coefficient must have a value of 0 0.3. And the coefficient is always unitless. In fact, you can go through and check that um, all the units cancel out in this expression. So that is all we have time for for this lecture. We're going to take some more examples of Newton's laws in the next lecture as well. Um, but hopefully, uh, after watching this lecture, you now have a better sense of some of the tools and techniques at your disposal that you can use to answer other questions involving Newton's laws.